a new version of Dune is out, both in theaters and on HBO Max in tandem. How is it, Adam? Well, that depends on who you are. Oh, before I grab a bucket and shovel and really start to dig into this adventure, I should ask you to subscribe to the channel. I do a lot of movie-related content here. I think you should stick around. It's worth your time. All right, let's proceed. From the visionary director, whose name I can't pronounce, that gave us Blade Runner 2049 and Arrival, comes Dune, or as it's properly known as, Dwayne. No, that's... That's not possibly right. We have a wide swath of actors that will appeal to all different audiences. We have the teen heartthrob boys, Timothy Chalamet and Zendaya. We have the superheroes, Drax and Aquaman. And we have the always reliable Stellan Skarsgård and Josh Brolin. You sprinkle in a little Oscar Isaac and you have a great cast all around, which you're gonna need because the movie is two and a half hours long. You know, it has the feel of a Lord of the Rings, where, where it's a continuous story, the journey's only just beginning, we're gonna get part two in the future. But Lord of the Rings felt, you know, even though it's not completed, the, the first part, uh, Fellowship of the Rings, had, had like a conclusion at the end there. Adam, shut up and tell me if you like it or not. Well, I liked it. And so did the buddy that I went with, and we had kind of an interesting circumstance. We didn't think there'd be many people at Dune. I don't know why, I just assumed it was kind of one of those kind of niche movies. It would go under the radar, the, you know, the David Bowie one, the Patrick Stewart one came out like in the 70s. It's old, it's it's campy. I, I just, I know it's based off a popular book series too, but still, I just didn't think it had the legs, but it was packed full. And we had to pick our seats and we did, there was no seats next to each other. So he was actually a seat up from me and I was sitting next to some rando. I was sitting next to quite the character too. He was all in on this movie. It's not scary at all. N not a single scare to be found. Yet he jumped twice during the movie. Just a full mini body seizure. He'd be watching and suddenly ah! and his hand would flail up and I'd be like ba -ba 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 and dodge it. It grazes the side of my hair at which I look over at him and I'm like, dude. This is not the way to go out. This is not how you want to die today. I also managed to like the film on top of the fact that there was a couple behind me that went shut the hell up the entire film. Talking loudly. I turned around at one point, an hour and 45 minutes into this. I gave him a lot of time. And I said, shut the fuck up. This is what I said to them out loud to strangers. That's how annoying and obnoxious they were being. These were adults. I'm past the point of being generous. I'm past the point of being courteous and nice. If they can't have respect for fellow moviegoers, stay home and watch it on HBO Max! They didn't stop talking either. So I still like the film at its two and a half hour runtime, at its slow pace, at its lack of action, with a full house in the theater being obnoxious, chewing candy, slurping their drinks and talking into my ear and having full body convulsions next to me. I still enjoyed the movie without a Coca-Cola classic in my hand because we got there and the line at the concesh, short for concession, was just, just ridiculous. It was snaking around the line. I keep doing this for some reason. So I went in thinking, all right, I'm gonna run out to the concession after about 45 minutes when there's a slow lull in the film. I can usually read it pretty well. I'll go out there. Well, I went out there and they already closed the concession. So this is like one of the few times in the history of ever that I haven't had a Coca-Cola in my hand drinking during the film. It was, it was very disheartening. It, it ruined some of the movie magic for me, some of the experience. Let's talk about the pros. For starters, the CGI is impeccable. It's very well done. It looks beautiful, uh, visually stunning. It begs to be seen on the big screen. I have HBO Max, I could have opted to watch it at home. Part of me feels like maybe that would have been a good idea considering the audience, but another part of me felt like, no, this is worthy of the huge IMAX theater experience and that's what I got. All the actors are great. Timothy Chamalais, Shamalama Ding Dong, I don't know how you say his name. He was good. I, I don't really know him from anything. Uh, young girls do, I guess. He's, he's kind of the big thing going on right now. I thought he was good. He was solid. Zendaya. Oh my God, Zendaya. Oh, wow. Just knocked it out of the park. What an amazing beauty. What a, what a perfect performance from her. Absolutely stunning. No, she's barely in it. I, I, people are praising her performance. She doesn't do shit. She's, she's barely in it. And, and when she's there, it's, it's pretty monotone. Uh, a lot of monotone talking in this film. There, there's not a lot of uh, bombastic characters. Jason Momoa was my favorite character here. I liked him every time he showed up. A little weird seeing him without a beard. That that was kind of off-putting. Momoa, to me, 
he loses about 50% of his attractiveness without that beard. He's he's the equivalent of the Beast from Beauty and the Beast when he turns back into Prince Adam, which is my name. And I wish I could marry Belle, but different world, different time. And she's a cartoon character. When he doesn't have the shaggy coat, he loses some of that animalistic, raw, uh, sexual uh, minutia to use words that might not make sense. I forgot Javier Bardem is in this. Rebecca Ferguson, my beautiful Rebecca Ferguson. She does thankfully have a good amount of screen time. I always love her. She's just such a treat. The, the, the movie was, was solid, but I am saying this as someone who really likes sci-fi films. I like bizarre shit and there's weird stuff going on in this. Not a lot of action though, as I said. So that's gonna turn some people off when you have to sit there for, you know, almost three hours. There's a ton of world building. I assume if you've read the book, a lot of this will be very easy to follow for someone like me. Uh, you know, they're throwing out all these different terms, all these different planets. There's aliens, there's people amongst each other. So you're, you're trying to kind of like piece it together. But when it's all said and done, it's really not that complicated of a story. It's just the way it's presented almost makes it more so. Uh, it, it's pretty kind of simple though. Spice is the, that's the hot commodity. Everybody wants spice. You're going to hear that word a lot. If you saw the original film, they're like, spice. They kind of whisper it in a really weird way. It's kind of silly. It comes off better here. As a mere mortal myself, I can't possibly comprehend all the different things that the spice has to offer. I know that it's rare though and people want to mine it. So there's different factions that want this for themselves, to make themselves wealthy, to enrich their communities. And you know, you have opposing forces. It's got the whole Star Wars playbook. I'm pretty sure Dune is older than Star Wars. If not, uh, you can drag me in the comments, but it very much has the white savior thing going on that I know Hollywood and, and, and some people are really rolling their eyes at lately. The whispers of a young man who will return balance and save things and yada yada yada. I would be interested to know because there is a, a couple lines of dialogue in this film um, from these women witches, these alien witch women. It's all women faction. And she says at one point, she's like, oh, you got you made a boy? You were supposed to make a girl. What, what, what the heck's the boy gonna do? The girls are way better. I'd love to know if that was in the book or if that was the writer like kind of projecting, thinking, yeah, we know this is a, a trope. This whole movie has been played out with the whole white knight saves the day. So let's throw on this couple lines of dialogue about how women rule too. I'd really love to know if that was in the book. I feel like that was tacked on. This movie felt like something that Zack Snyder would look at and say, I've been trying to do this with the DCEU, but never could because I was handcuffed. This is a film that Zack Snyder dreams of making. It's got the eclectic music in the background. It's a very hard, heavy music at the end. The constant chanting was a little overwhelming. It was a bit much for me. Uh, Snyder would be just creaming listening to that. It's got the muted color palette and for two and a half hours that can start to drown out, especially during the night shots that I, I was starting to veer off about two hours in when they got to the night stuff. I was just kind of like, um, Daisy, no, bring me back, movie, bring me back. It's just talking and kind of drab colors. After the movie was done, there was herds of people outside the theater talking about it, including me and my buddy chatting about the different things in the film, uh, about what we liked and disliked and the story and where it could go from here and whatnot. So to reiterate, I love this director. I liked this movie. I didn't love it. I watched it and wanted to love it as it was unfolding. I really did, but I liked it. And I'm excited for part two. Didn't even know it was a part one until the, the Dune came up and it says part one right underneath. I don't remember that being marketed at all. Maybe it is and I just have been blind to all that. Yeah, so this is not a movie for everyone for sure. My wife, I don't think would like it in the slightest. It's gonna turn off a good group of people. But for those that are really into heavy sci-fi, into the lore, uh, into all that weird shit, I think you're gonna dig it.